My wife and I belong to what some have termed the sandwich generation because our parents are living longer than people did in the past and because as a general rule and we fit this description ourselves people are having children later we find ourselves uh, you know bringing up children at the same time that our parents are uh, approaching the end of their lives and needing to care simultaneously uh, for the generation uh, that preceded us and the one that is coming along after. Hence, the sandwich. Now, we've been blessed that, uh, uh, with the exception of my wife's father, uh, our uh, parents have been uh, very healthy and uh, remain living independently. Um, but you know, you can sort of see the handwriting on the wall. My dad turned to 90 this year. And so as our uh, daughter is preparing to graduate from high school in the spring and go off presumably to college someplace, and we really don't know where yet, could be in California or in the Pacific Northwest or in Maine. So anyway, uh, you know, the thought sort of comes to us, well, so, you know, what next? And where next? And uh, my own parents in 2005, uh, seeing their rural lifestyle slowly eroding with the suburban sprawl extending northeastward from Sacramento, uh, decided to sell out and go back to the last place they had lived before uh, coming to live in my grandfather's house uh, on Fruitvale Road between Lincoln and Auburn, and moved back to Wisconsin, where along the way they had deposited a couple of my brothers. We both live in Madison and work for the University of Wisconsin there. And over the years, as you might imagine, I've, you know, felt a certain pull as the phone gets passed around at family gatherings on Thanksgiving or Easter, and I get to speak in turn to my brothers and my sisters-in-law and my nieces and nephews and my parents and wishing that I was a bit closer. But we've also approached this uh, dilemma with a certain kind of practicality, a certain kind of division of labor, if you will. And with Meg's sister living in Washington, near Washington, D.C., where up until a few years ago, uh, her father resided, and with two of my brothers there in Wisconsin, kind of keeping an eye on my parents, uh, Meg and myself are the only ones of our generation living in any proximity to her mother and stepfather who retired about 25 years ago to Southern Oregon. I mention all this, of course, in connection with the Hebrew Bible lesson today from the book of Ruth. Ruth faces a far more uh, consequential dilemma than the one I've just described, having lost her husband and her brother-in-law and her father-in-law and uh, choosing to accompany her mother-in-law, Naomi, an Ephraimite from Bethlehem who had left uh, her ancestral home because of famine and gone to live in the land of Moab where her son had married Ruth. And Ruth, the Moabite 
woman, the widow, chooses to go with Naomi back to Bethlehem, back to go, as she says, with you wherever you go, to lodge with you wherever you lodge, to die where you die and be buried where you are buried. For your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Now, we don't really know exactly why this story was important enough for the people of Israel to have told it, and to have written it down, and to have included it in, in their canon of the scriptures. The scholars are pretty well agreed that it does not date from the time in which the story is set, the period of the judges before the first kings of Israel. Some suppose that perhaps it was written in the post-exilic period as a kind of rejoinder to the uh, priest Ezra, who commanded the Israelites not to marry foreign women. Others will say that maybe it dates to sometime early in the United Kingdom of David and Solomon as a way of kind of justifying the hegemony of Judah over neighbors like those in Moab. But whatever the you know, kind of ulterior motive, I think the real point is that it's just a really good story. And people need to know, they want to know, and want to hear the stories of their ancestors. Over the last several weeks, we've been hearing some testimonies related to our fall stewardship campaign here at St. John's, which is been a time for us to reflect on, among other things, what value does this community really hold for us? And what is it that motivates us to want to care for it and to perpetuate it and to commit ourselves to its maintenance and its future? And perhaps it's because, in part, among other things, this is one of the few places you can go to hear ancestral stories in our culture today. Not that stories like the story of Ruth are stories of our literal biological ancestors, but they're stories about the people who came before us and what they learned of God. And they're stories that were treasured by our ancestors who told them and learned them and read them and spoke them aloud down through the generations. And in this world where it is, seems to be uh, increasingly common to think of our ancestors as inferior to us, they were all ignorant and superstitious and drunks and abusers and white supremacists and whatever other failings we might wish to lodge against our society, we pin on them and contrast them unfavorably with ourselves, with our enlightenment and our uh, liberal points of view. And yet without ancestors, without the stories about them, without a living sense of our connection to them and the debt that we owe them, we are ill-prepared to accept the truth that we ourselves will be ancestors one day. 
without a sense of our living connection with the past, with the people who face the same moral quandaries that we do, who were shaped by the same kinds of emotions, the same kinds of needs, the same kinds of perplexities that shape us. We are ill-prepared to pass on to the next generation the stories and the values and the attitudes and the truths that will enable them to do the same. This is a time of year when we acknowledge those connections, our connection with our own ancestors, and the fact that we ourselves are only a short time here on Earth, and that whatever it is that we leave behind is an inheritance that we are passing along not something that we are just inventing out of whole cloth, out of the present circumstances, but that those present circumstances are shaped for us profoundly by those who came before. And in this particular time in human history, when we recognize that our own way of living puts the very possibility of that inheritance passing down to future generations at serious risk, it may be incumbent upon us to think differently about who those ancestors are and who our descendants will be, that we have tended in our Christian tradition to define too narrowly our ancestral inheritance, not recognizing that 92% of our DNA we share with our dogs, <laughs> that in fact we are kindred not only with all human beings everywhere throughout the world, but that we are the fruit and the product of 14 billion years of ancestors, that our ancestors include the first generation of stars in whose fiery deaths the complex molecules everything bigger than helium and hydrogen that make up our bodies and our world were formed. That our ancestors extend back through four and a half billion years of Earth evolution. That in our guts are the bacteria that go back to the very beginnings of life that we have been shaped by this great story of ancestors who lived and died so that a new generation might live and die and live and die and live and die in a process of ever-growing complexity and interdependence, a process of which we are the great culmination with that complexity written not only in our biological bodies, but in our capacities for imagination, for storytelling, for ethical teaching, for anticipating and responding to the future. Because we have ancestors, we can imagine our descendants, not just our biological human offspring, 
but all the future generations of the earth whose life now hangs in the balance. The decisions that we make now over the next few years will be determinative of what that future holds, of whether we are better than our ancestors in any appreciable sense, whether we have really learned anything from our gospel and can love our neighbors in the future, our neighbors in the oceans, in the soil, in the forests, our neighbors who cry out to us for our love. And we love them as we love ourselves.